person from Singapore once wrote a letter to John Fuang, talking about his practice and asking for some advice. And he said his practice was to see everything in daily life in terms of the three characteristics. He'd watch TV and see how this is inconstant, stressful, not self. The traffic was inconstant, stressful, not self. <clears throat> everything, he would apply those three labels to it. And John Fung had me write back to him and say, don't place the blame on things outside. Turn around and look inside your own mind. That's where the real problem is. This is a perspective we have to keep in mind all the time, because we're not just passive recipients of things. The mind is active. It goes out looking for happiness and all kinds of things. And the search for happiness is not the problem. It's that we go about it in ways that are not skillful. The problem is that we act in ignorance. It's one of the reasons why we meditate, is so we can see our choices clearly. Because every time you act, you make a choice. You're either going to do it or you're not. You're going to do this as opposed to that. And you have to weigh things. What's worth doing, what's not worth doing. It's a value judgment. We're judging what's worth holding on to, what's not worth holding on to, what's worth holding on to for the time being, and what's worth letting go right away. Because the Buddha doesn't have you let go of everything all at once. We've got the path here, and this concentration we're doing right now. You've got to hold on to your object. Stay with the breath all the way in, all the way out. And learn how to hold on without squeezing it. The image in the text is of holding a baby quail in your hand. If you hold it too tightly, it's going to die. If you hold it too loosely, it's going to fly away. You've got to figure out just the right amount of pressure and the way of sticking with it without messing it all up. If you clamp down too hard on the breath, force it too much, it's going to get very uncomfortable. It's not going to be a good place to stay. Just try to keep in contact with it. And any thoughts that would come into the mind that don't deal with the breath, just let them go. If they come in again, you let them go again. In the beginning, your first line of defense is just that. Anything that's not related to the breath, you've got to try to let go. And if it keeps coming back, coming back, coming back, you have to be really insistent, not paying attention to it. It's like a stray puppy who wants to move into your house, but you don't want the puppy. And it's going to make all kinds of sad noises, but you have to be firm. And if it gets so that you can't be firm with it that way and you give in to thinking about it, whatever the thought is, then you've got to look at the drawbacks. But when you're looking at the drawbacks of something, you have to also look at the allure. Why is it that the mind goes there? Sometimes it has a secret pleasure. Sometimes it has a sense of obligation, or a sense that you've got to tie up the loose ends of the thought. That's a big temptation right there. Remind yourself that the world is full of loose ends. We like to think of the, our lives reaching closure of some kind, our relationships reaching closure. But you look at the way people pass away, you look at the way relationships end, there's a lot of loose ends dangling, and you have to learn how to live with the loose ends. If the thought that's coming up is dealing with some bad relationship you had in the past, well, have lots of goodwill for yourself and the other person. Remembering that karma is really complex, and you don't know how far back into the past these things go. 
rather than keeping tally or keeping score, you just say, okay, enough of that. Goodwill for yourself, goodwill for others, and move on. But to let go of something, you have to see why you're holding on, what the allure is. And again, holding on is not like you're holding on with your hand. The mind doesn't have a hand that it can hold things in a, in a fist or a grip. For the mind to hold on means it just keeps coming back to doing the same thing again and again and again. So we're back to that issue of actions. Here it's the actions in the mind. Got to figure out why you keep going to something that's not that skillful. Sometimes it's just a lack of imagination. You can't think of any other way of relating to that particular issue. Which is why it's good to read the Dharma, good to listen to the Dharma, because the Buddha gives you new ways of taking apart that harassing thought, new ways of perceiving the situation, new ways of perceiving the, the way you're dealing with it right now. Remember his word for clinging can also mean to feed on things. Why are you feeding on this? What nourishment is the mind trying to get out of it, and does it offer that nourishment? You do this contemplation to give rise to dispassion. The point we get that you don't really need that thought anymore. It doesn't hold any allure. Then you really let it go. Then you come back to the breath. So the Buddhist teachings are all about what we're doing and why we're causing ourselves suffering through what we do and why we don't have to, what alternatives we have, alternative ways of acting that actually form a path away from that suffering. There's a value judgment here, too, that suffering is not what you want. It's a choice you make. The Buddha is not forcing this choice on you. But if you realize that you've created a lot of unnecessary suffering, it's weighing the mind down. And when the mind gets weighed down like this, then you're less helpful to other people, too. You spend all your time carrying your problem around, and you don't have time to shoulder anybody else's loads. So take some time to. Look at what you're doing and figure out how you can do things in a different way. But the choice is yours. And realize that it is a choice. We're making these choices all the time, every time we act. And the Buddha wants us to put a spotlight on that, because it's right there that the source of the suffering lies and the suffering itself, but also the potential for a way out also lies there in what we're doing. So try to be careful in how you make your choices. As the Buddha said, heedfulness is the source of what's skillful. In other words, we realize there are dangers in our mind. The dangers outside are nothing to, compared to the dangers that we can create for ourselves. So a lot of things you do have to be wary of. But again, the things you're wary of are qualities in your own mind. We like to think that we're basically good people. But then we have these other potentials as well. It's not that we're basically good or evil. It's just the mind has both kinds of potentials. If it didn't have potentials for really bad stuff, then the no matter how bad your social conditioning outside would be, you'd never be tempted. But it's because we have both kinds of potentials. We have to be careful to see which potentials we're going to choose, to choose to develop, to choose to nurture, through the way we speak and think and act. So we get the mind still. That's a kind of action, too, because 
It's a good one, though, because it puts us in a position where we can see what other things are going on, what other things we're doing, and learn how to sort them out. Because this is for our own good and for the people around us.